Are you all excited? I think Lorelai's You know, Christmas, lots of our world focuses on getting presents and celebration and things like that. But as believers, we know that Christmas has a much greater meaning, don't we? That should have been much louder. I, I, I hope you know that it has, a, thank you, appreciate it, has a much greater meaning. You know, I was thinking about where I wanted to do a devotional or a short time in the Word this evening, and I wanted to go to the book of Isaiah, but we wouldn't get out of here until tomorrow. But I'll just kind of share a couple things about Isaiah. Remember, it was written to Israel, and the Israelites were trying to find all their satisfaction in everything but who? Christ, their future Messiah. They, they tried to find satisfaction in, in uh, kings, in, in other false gods. They tried to find satisfaction in themselves. And then you remember Isaiah... Remember in Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14, Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6, it tells them about the future Messiah. Do you remember those passages? Okay. Where it talks about the virgin will be the child and bear a son, and you shall call his name what? Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Prince of Peace. That is their coming Messiah. And so I want each of us for the next few minutes while I'm up here to ask yourself a question. How are you responding to Jesus? And you can answer that question very fast, but if you have your Bible, I invite you to turn to Matthew chapter 2. In Matthew chapter 2, well, the end of chapter 1 and end of chapter 2, we have three responses to Jesus. Remember, we had Joseph and Mary. You all familiar with that, right? Okay, it's okay to interact with me because we're going to have to interact to make this work. Otherwise, we'll be here till tomorrow regardless. But do you remember, try to put yourself for a second in the shoes of Joseph, okay? Joseph is engaged to Mary. And the word engaged under, in the Jewish time, it was much different than our engagement. Our engagement today, like I've met people, I have friends who they got engaged for like two years. What? Like, that's crazy. But an engagement under, in Jewish times was, was like a marriage already. And so just imagine Joseph, right? Joseph finds out that Mary is with child and goes into panic mode. He didn't go into panic mode. But if you read the end of chapter 1, you will learn that Joseph followed through with immediate obedience to Jesus. And so when I ask you, how are you responding to Jesus? You either can be responding to Jesus in obedience. What I mean by that is, is Jesus says in Luke 9, 23, he says, deny yourself, take up your cross when you feel like it, and follow me. No, it doesn't say that. He says, deny yourself, take up your cross daily, and follow me. Those of us who profess faith and trust in Jesus Christ alone for our salvation, he wants our entire life. And my question is, are you living a life of obedience every second of every day, pursuing a life of obedience? Is your response to Jesus like Joseph's, who obeyed? And then in Matthew chapter 2, the, the section that Richard read this evening was the Magi. Think about the Magi for a second. The Magi were out in a field watching sheep and... They follow a star, right? Huh? Is that what, what I say wrong? Oh, they were not in the field of sheep. Sorry. 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 But what did the Magi do? The Magi followed what? A star. Have you all ever looked outside and looked up? You ever try to count the stars? Try it tonight. Go outside and try to count the stars and put yourself in the Magi's shoes, right? When, when, they, when they went to find Jesus, they followed the star. It was an intense game of hide and seek, right? They wanted to find Jesus, but why did they want to find this baby? 
If you were here Sunday, help me. What? They wanted to worship Jesus. They wanted to worship Jesus. Now, if you're here tonight and you know Jesus and you say, yes, I want to, to follow Jesus in obedience and I, I want to worship him. My question there is, are, do you ever allow things to hinder your worship to God? If God is up here and I'm down here, I should be on my face before God, worshiping him every second of every day. But how often do we allow things to get in here and cloud our worship of Jesus? It could be the busyness of life. It could be your career. It could be your grandkids. It could be the turmoil in America. I don't care what it is. But those things can cloud our worship of Jesus. And I want us to quickly look at the third response in chapter 2, verse 16 and following. But you have to remember some of the things that Richard read. Remember when the, the Magi were going to Jesus? Where did they first go? Do you remember? They went to Jerusalem. And they went to Jerusalem. And what did it say about the people in Jerusalem? Things were stirred up, right? Things were stirred up because of Herod and News travels, doesn't it? And the Magi go into Jerusalem. This is not like a little cedar edge. This is Jerusalem. Lots of people. And they go to Jerusalem, and they were not ashamed. People, they were asking people, where is he? Where is Jesus? There's application for us right there, right, as believers? Are you ashamed to say that I'm a child of God? If you are, there's a problem. You ought not to be ashamed. But these magi, they were so intent on finding this Jesus. And where did they go? The people didn't know, and so they went to Herod the king. And what did Herod say? Herod said, when you find him, what? Come and tell me, right? Come and tell me so that I can go and worship him too. That's not what Herod wanted. Herod began to feel the pressure. Herod began to be intimidated. The question for you is, how are you responding to Jesus? If you have your Bible, look at Matthew 2, verse 1. It says there, Now after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, in the days of Herod the king, Magi from the east arrived in Jerusalem. It's important that you are aware that Herod was king at the point that Jesus was born. But keep in mind what has happened in chapter 1, as well as the beginning of chapter 2. Joseph was betrothed to Mary. Joseph went forward with the marriage ceremony as a result of what the angel of the Lord told him. The birth was fulfilled, like Isaiah 7.14 says, Isaiah 9.6. The Magi worshipped Jesus. Now, I want us to just look at Matthew 2, verse 3. It says, when Herod the king heard this, he was troubled. And all Jerusalem with him. What did Herod hear? Herod heard about this king, Jesus, who was born. He heard that the Magi were looking for this individual who had been born king of the Jews. And in the text, it says that he was troubled. That word troubled means that he was frightened. Things were stirred up to cause a riot. Can you imagine how Herod felt? No? Can you imagine? Has anything ever got you stirred up? How about the way that our world's going? Does that have any of you all stirred up? I'm, I'm serious. Anybody stirred up about it? A couple of you would be honest. Yeah. Stirred up, confused, overwhelmed, frustrated, whatever it is. But imagine the news is traveling around and this king hears about the baby who was born king of the Jews. Going, He's going, oh no, what's happening? You see, Herod is intimidated about this baby. Matthew chapter 2, verse 7, it says, Then Herod secretly called the Magi and determined from them the exact time the star appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and search carefully for the child, and when you have found him, 
report to me so that I too may come and worship him. You see, Herod was intimidated by the fact that there's a Jesus. You know, we live in a world where people call themselves a Christian and they're on their way to hell. Do you understand that? Do you understand that Jesus is not a good luck charm? Jesus is not a genie where we, we pull out our, 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 our genie and we, we rub the cup and say, okay, Jesus, I need a little bit of Jesus today. so and so sick. So-and-so's in the hospital. That's not the Jesus of the Bible. You see, Herod was intimidated about this baby. Herod now tries to deceive the Magi, doesn't he? The Magi, from what I see in the text, they're not afraid, are they? They're not, they're not afraid one bit. How are you responding to Jesus? Are you afraid to be sold out for Jesus? You know, as I was studying this passage in Matthew 2, I was looking and asking myself this question. It's interesting that Herod, or why is Herod asking so many questions? Why is he interested in so much detail? He wants to know about the star. He says, go, find Jesus. But notice the word carefully. Kind of says, oh, by the way, when you find Jesus, tell me so that I can worship him too. I don't know, what do you think the Magi did when they heard that? I think maybe their, their eyebrows might have been lifted a little bit like, what? Right? I don't know. See, Herod has gone from intimidation because Jesus is said to be king of the Jews. That really stirred things up within Herod's heart. Now being quick on his toes, he tries to think of some way to stop Jesus from being the king of the Jews. So his first thought is, let me... Try to deceive the Magi. How are you responding to Jesus? You ever been intimidated by somebody? Has anybody ever tried to intimidate you because your love for God? No? Okay. We need to hang out some. Because if, if you are responding to Jesus the way that Joseph did, with wanting to obey him, not because we have to in order to be saved, we want to obey him because we love him. That's what it says in John 14, 15. Jesus says, if you love me, keep my commandments. It's, uh, my, my love for God is so great that I want to walk with God. I want to become conformed to the image of Christ because I love my God. This has no merit on my eternal destiny. Is that how you are responding to Jesus? Are you responding to Jesus saying, I want to worship you every second of every day? Does anybody struggle reading their Bibles? This is like confession. The teens are like, yeah, I do. We've talked about it. You see, we fall into this category so often as believers that we think, oh man, I read a chapter a day that's going to keep the devil away. But that's not biblical. That is not biblical. We, sometimes we fall into the, the category of, oh, I read my Bible today, and then an hour later, somebody says, hey, what did you read? And you're like, uh, the Bible. But see, if we really want to respond the way the Magi did, we have the Word of God in our hands, and our laps. And He's given us the Word of God that has every answer to every problem we will ever face. But so often, we just kind of let it lay to the side. In reality, when we don't open up our Bibles, what we're saying in our hearts is, God, I don't need you today. I can get by today on my own. Let's look at how, how Herod responds. In chapter 2, look at verse 16. It says, Then when Herod saw that he had been tricked by the Magi, he became very enraged. 
and sent and slew all the male children who were in Bethlehem and all its vicinity from two years old and under, according to the time which he had determined from the Magi. Then what had been spoken through Jeremiah the prophet was fulfilled, a voice and uh, a voice was heard in Ramah weeping in great mourning, Rachel weeping for her children, and she refused to be comforted because they were no more. So what was Herod's response to Jesus? Herod's response was, I hate you, Jesus. I hate you so much that I'm going to go to the extreme. And I'm going to have all these children killed. Herod knew that Jesus was the coming Messiah. If you look at chapter 2, verse 4, when Herod realized that the Magi had tricked him. He responded foolishly. The question that we might ask is, do you think it was the Magi's intent to trick Herod? Do you think the Magi, one commentator says this, quote, it was not their purpose to trick or mock the king, but simply to obey God's command not to return to Herod. Verse 12. The king, of course, knew nothing of God's warning and saw only that the wise men did not do as he had instructed. End quote. In the midst of Herod's anger, he responds irrationally by saying, now I'm going to have all the male children to and under killed. Notice the progression that, that Herod went through. The progression was he was intimidated by the news that he heard from the Magi and others. Then he tried to deceive the Magi. Then finally he went to an irrational decision to have all of these children killed. How sad. When it says that he was enraged, he was extremely angry. One person says this, quote, Enraged by the Magi's failure to report back to him, committed one of the bloodiest acts of his career, and certainly the cruelest, end quote. My question to you is, how are you responding to Jesus? Yo, there's no middle ground, right? Just be honest with yourself. Are, are, you, are you obeying and worshiping Christ every second of every day? Or are you just filled with hatred? You know, we have people that call themselves agnostic. They call themselves atheists. Do you really believe that there's a thing called an atheist today? No, I, I, I don't believe there is. I tell them, I say, you're just a chicken. You're just a chicken. Because everybody knows that there's a God, right? Yeah, y'all can answer. Yeah, we all know there's a God, don't we? The problem is, is that an atheist, when somebody is an atheist, they say, I don't believe in God, that's okay. But the problem is, is they realize that when they embrace and accept the fact that there's a God, that God is also their judge. And we live in a world where we don't like accountability. Do y'all like accountability? If you're walking faithfully with Christ, accountability is awesome. But how about when, when maybe you, you have a sin pattern in your life? You're like, I don't want to be accountable. That's Romans chapter 1. It says everybody knows that there's a God. The problem is, is they suppress the truth because they just want to push it down. They don't want to believe in a God. He goes on in, in Matthew chapter 2. And it says in verse 19, just reading on to the end of the chapter, it says, But when Herod died, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared in a dream to Joseph in Egypt and said, Get up, take the child and his mother, and go into the land of Israel, for those who sought the child's life are dead. So Joseph got up, took the child and his mother, and came into the land of Israel. But when he heard 
that Archelaus was reigning over Judea in the place of his father Herod, he was afraid to go there. Then, after being warned by God in a dream, he left for the regions of Galilee and came and lived in a city called Nazareth. This was to fulfill what was spoken through the prophets. He shall be called a Nazarene. You know, for just a second, and I'll be done in a minute, we might get out of here before seven, y'all. How are you responding to Jesus? How are you responding to Jesus? Y'all, as as believers, as brothers and sisters in Christ, we struggle with sin, don't we? No? Okay, if you don't, come talk to me because I need help. But we struggle with sin, don't we? Do you remember the Apostle Paul, the great man of God, came to Christ on the road to Damascus? And Paul says in Romans 7, the very thing that I want to do, I can't do. And the thing that I don't want to do, I always do. You know what he's talking about? He's talking about the battle of sin. We struggle with sin. And so I asked the question, how are you responding to Jesus? We're never going to live a perfect life here on the earth. But as a believer, we ought to want to walk with Christ. We want to become conformed to the image of Christ. Do you know what God's will is for your life and my life? The Bible tells us, y'all know that? In 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, I think verse 2 or 3, he says, God's will for you is your sanctification. You know what that word sanctification means? It simply means setting apart. When, when we came to Christ, we realized that we had a sin problem, right? Okay, thank you. We have a major sin problem. And because of our sin, we deserve to die and go to hell. The Bible tells us that in Daniel chapter 12, verse 3, some will await to everlasting life and others to everlasting contempt. We have to realize that our sin sends us to hell. And I hear all the time, well, Jay, God's not fair. Do we want a fair God? I don't want a fair God. I don't want a fair God because I'm the one that chose to sin. We're the ones that chose to sin. And if you're here saying, you know what, Jake, I, I, don't, I think I'm a good person. I've never sinned. We can just do a little test. In Exodus chapter 20, we have the Ten Commandments. Are you all familiar with any of those? How about the ones where he says, honor your father and mother? <laughs> don't talk to my dad. <laughs> I didn't do very well at that one. And so right there, I was rebellious. How about the one where he says, don't take God's name in vain? Anybody ever let that three-letter word slip out of your mouth? You hit your hand with a hammer or something like that, and it just slips out. Well, if you accidentally use God's name in vain, the Bible says you're a blasphemer. You see, in Leviticus chapter 19, I believe it's verse 2, it says that God is holy. God is perfect. God is perfect without sin, and his standard is perfection. And just with those two, with disobeying our parents, we are rebellious. And if we accidentally let those those three-letter words slip out of our mouth and say, "Oh, oh my God, or something like that, we are then blasphemers. But if we need to keep going, we look at the one where where Jesus says, do not commit adultery. We're like, oh, I got that made. You know what Jesus says? If you look at somebody and lust after them, you've committed adultery in your heart. How about murder? We have any murderers in here? Okay, a couple of you bad people. No, you know what the Bible says? The Bible says that if you hate your brother, you hate somebody, you've murdered them. Do we have any other murderers now? Because I'm there. Wow. You see, if God is the judge and he is perfect and he is holy and we're in a courtroom and we're presenting our case that we are good people, are you guilty or not guilty? I'm guilty. I don't know about you. See, every one of us are guilty because we are the ones that willfully chose to sin. And because of our sin, the Bible says the wages of sin is death. We deserve to die and go to hell. That's a fair God. I'm thankful that we don't have a fair God. Because the God that I love and the God that we serve, the God of the Bible says that he demonstrated his own love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died. Isn't that awesome? I mean, when I come to Christmas, y'all, I, I get fired up. 
I don't know how I can get more fired up than I already am fired up, but I do get more fired up because that's a good thing. How are we responding to Jesus? Our God, if you're here and you've never placed your faith in Jesus, I love you so much that I'll tell you, I hope you don't sleep tonight. I hope you don't sleep until you deal with your eternal destiny. At least be honest with yourself, right? So many people, I talk to them all day, it's all, all day. I talk to them a lot throughout the day. Well, Jake, we believe the same thing. <laughs> My friend, we don't believe the same thing. We don't believe the same thing. This is what God says. But God sent his son to this earth. He's born in a manger. He lives a perfect life. How about that right there? Can you imagine that? He lives a perfect life, the hypostatic union, 100% God and 100% man. How he did it, I don't know, but I'm so thankful, aren't you? That he lived a perfect life. Because if Jesus didn't live a perfect life, he could not atone for the sins of the world on the cross. Did you know that? You know, in the book of Leviticus, we learn about all kinds of animal sacrifices, right? And they had to offer the, the sin offering. And they had to do it on a regular basis over and over and over and over. Do you know why they did that? Because those animals were not perfect and they kept sinning. And they kept offering. It would do you no good. If I stand up here and say, I love you, I'm going to go die on the cross for you. Does that do anything for you? No, because I'm a dirty, rotten sinner. Jesus... God's standard was perfection, and Jesus had to be God to live a perfect life. And as he hung on the cross and those nails were beaten into his hands, it was as if your sin and my sin, put your name in there. Put your name in there and say, your name was nailed. Your sins were beaten into the body of Jesus, the perfect God. My sin was beaten into his perfect body. And in 2 Corinthians, I think it's 5, 21. He, God, made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf so that we might, what? Become the righteousness of God, righteousness of God in him. That's cool, isn't it? That's amazing. God treated Jesus as if he had lived my sinful, wretched, godless life. And then God treats me as if I had lived Jesus' perfect, sinless life. That's called justification, where he legally declares us righteous. And if you're here tonight and you're responding the way that, that Herod is, and you hate God, and you hate Christ, and you say, God is not fair, he's done all these things in my life, and all this stuff has happened. Remember, God doesn't owe you anything. Understand that God does not owe you one single thing. And if you don't know Christ, I pray that you would realize James chapter 4, verse 14 says life is a vapor. It goes so fast. You don't know when you leave tonight, if you get in a car wreck and die, I pray that doesn't happen. But if it does, I would ask, where are you going to spend eternity? How are you responding to Jesus? If you don't know Christ, I pray, I plead with you to be reconciled to Christ. And if you're here and you know Christ, let me just challenge you. I trust if you're anything like me, and I hope you're not too much like me, but I sin, and I struggle with sin. Anybody else struggle with sin? You see, the five of you that are honest, the rest of you are liars. No, I'm just kidding. Just kidding. Let me just share something with you. We all struggle with sin. But see, God's will is that, that we are to be sanctified. That is, that we continue to grow in our walk with Christ. You see, because we love God, we want to keep his commandments. And when we keep his commandments, we are becoming conformed to the image of God. And I pray for myself, I pray for you, that if you are a believer, that is you understand that salvation is by grace alone, through faith alone, and Christ alone. I just pray that you would evaluate your life and see, okay, how am I doing it at obeying God, God's word? How am I doing in worshiping God? Are there things that, that are maybe clouding my, my worship of God? And maybe, y'all, maybe it's just the busyness of life. The busyness of life. Some of you are like, Jake, who are you to say that? <laughs> Thanks. 
But, but as brothers and sisters, we ought to help each other, bear with one another, encourage each other onto love and good deeds. That's biblical. But may we identify areas maybe where it's clouding our worship of God, the busyness of life, or maybe your, your marriage is struggling, maybe your marriage is failing, or your relationship with your kids or your grandkids or whatever it is. Pray about it. Take it to the Lord. But the obedience one, look at your life and go, okay, where am I not obeying the Lord? Maybe I, I have a pattern of sin. Maybe it's I'm not living with my wife in an understanding way. Maybe it's um, I'm not loving my fellow brothers and sisters in Christ. Maybe it's I, I'm struggling with selfishness. Maybe it's anger. Maybe it's my thought life. Whatever it may be, be honest with yourself. And the first step in becoming conformed to the image of Christ is to identify those sins and call them what they are, right? Call them sin. Call sin, sin. But then what you need to do is you need to set up practical steps to become conformed to the image of Christ because you love Him. So do that. Identify sins in your life and then make a plan of action to become conformed to the image of Christ. And if you, once you get that plan of action, get accountability. Talk to a uh, a brother or a sister in Christ that you love and that will pray for you and help you and encourage you because that's biblical. And then do those things so that you can become like Jesus. But I'll leave you with how are you responding to Jesus? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you for who you are. I thank you, Lord, that you are King of kings and Lord of lords. You are the Alpha, the Omega. You are the great I am. And Father, I just pray that each one of us would evaluate our lives and answer the question, how are we responding to Jesus? And Lord, I pray you start with me first and foremost. Every second of every day. It's so easy to say, yes, I need to obey and, and worship. But Father, I pray that we really evaluate and see if there's areas in our lives maybe that we're not obeying you or there's things in our lives that are clouding our worship of the Almighty God, I pray that as believers we would encourage each other on to love and good deeds and we would seek to be beacons of light to proclaim the excellencies of Christ. And Lord, I pray if there's one here that does not know Christ, I pray that you break them of their pride. I pray that you bring them to their knees, help them to realize the severity of sin, to realize that their sin sends them to hell. May they come to understand that salvation is by grace alone, through faith alone, and Christ alone. And I pray that you use these things for your glory in Christ's name. Amen.